Okay, we ready? Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, we have a full group here now. Today is Monday, August 10th, 2020. Uh, we're at uh, West Pasco Government Center holding our MPO Technical Advisory Committee meetings this afternoon. I appreciate those that are here physically to help us make our quorum and for those that are virtual as well, uh, that have opportunities to chime in. And um, so we're, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our agenda today. Um, call the meeting to order. And I guess we could go through introductions. I'm Todd Vandenberg, City of Zephyr Hills. I'm Debbie Bolden, Engineering Services Administration. Oh, wasn't I? <laughs> I am, okay. Deborah Boldick, Engineering Services Administration. You're on. The red light's on. You're on. Okay. I'm Irja Molly, Senior Transportation Planner with Long Range Planning. Cynthia Spidell, Co Economic Development Council. Kurt Shadowfield. Kurt Shadowfield, CPT Director. Kurt Scheibel, PCPT Director. Tina Russo, MPO Staff. Manny Lajmiri, MPO Staff. Okay. All right. Do we, do we need to have for the record the uh, folks that are online or not? I do have who is online, but they can go ahead and introduce themselves with no help. Yeah, go ahead, folks. The folks that are calling in, could you just introduce yourself real quick? Ronnie Black here, MPO staff. Tania Gorman, Pasco MPO. Lori Shadiger, Pasco MPO. Len Tadwadikuti, Pasco Traffic Operations. Okay, thank you. All. This is Wally Blaine, Tyndale Oliver. And we know Melanie's on. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to have a few pointers about our hybrid virtual meeting requirements. Uh, we want to start with that now. Sure, hey, Ronnie, you want to? Yes, I will. Um, for the record, again, Ronnie Blackshear, MPO staff. Uh, Governor DeSantis Executive Order 20 150, which is the latest. Latest executive order, which extended an original executive order 20 69 that expired on August 1st. This latest extension, uh, 20 150, extends the ability of local governments to conduct fully virtual meetings until September 1st. Uh, the governor still recommends senior citizens and high risk individuals avoid crowds and all residents avoid groups of more than 50 persons. The governor Task force also recommends continuing to allow virtual participation in phase two. Um, the Board of County Commissioners, Pasco Board of County Commissioners adopted resolution 20-182 on June 30th to allow county public meetings to be conducted both in person and through communications media technology. Uh, these are the hybrid virtual meetings. And this resolution also allowed for the MPO and its advisory committees to also conduct these all these hybrid virtual meetings under the same resolution. Now with the T CAC and TAC, there are meeting prior to the MPO's meeting, which is this coming Thursday, the MPO also will have its own resolution that's kind of will piggyback on this one so that we'll have our own so that we can continue to conduct virtual hybrid meetings. These hybrid virtual meetings are similar to the fully virtual meetings, except for these exceptions. Quorum must be present, must be physically present at the advertised location. Hence, that's the reason why we need to have a quorum physically present at the location today. Other voting members can attend virtually for health reasons or to maintain social distancing. Uh, boardrooms are closed to the public except for staff and presenters who are required or are invited to attend and no more than 50 people in the boardroom. Uh, phone phone in is no longer an option, and a public comment is limited to WebEx. 
email or the new public comment kiosk in the lobby of the West Pasco Government Center and the East Pasco Government Center. Um, that concludes my take on the hybrid virtual meetings and I'll stand for questions. Okay, hearing none, we'll move forward on the agenda. Do we have any public comment for today's TAC meeting? There is none at this time. Thank you. Okay, I'd ask the, the board members to take a look in your packet. Uh, the minutes of the meeting of June 8, 2020. Uh, call for any comments or questions or amendments. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll okay. second it. Okay, we've had a, a motion to approve by Debbie and a, a seconded by Cynthia. Um, I guess, do we need to go through individually and list our names? No? All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next item is report on MPO board actions from the MPO June 11, 2020 meeting. Any, any updates on that? Or? Hey, Ronnie, do you want to do that? Uh, sure. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, for the record, Ronnie Blackshirt with the MPO staff. Well, the board met on June 11th, um, and several of the action items included the transportation performance measures consensus planning document. This item was reviewed, um, was uh, given by the staff. Um, the item itself, this consensus planning, uh, planning document uh, incorporates as an amendment to the TRP, was incorporated as an amendment to the TRP last fall and would now be incorporated by reference in the resolution. This uh, amendment actually allows the board now to uh when wherever we do present our tip we do not have to have a second or an amendment to the tip in order to incorporate this this document actually is the document that actually lists the performance measures that has been established by the uh, stakeholders uh the mpo the transit public agency pcpt and it was incorporated or developed in conjunction with the, uh, all of the MPOs in the state by the, the other MPO Advisory Council and also the Florida Department of Transportation. And this actually report is actually a system report to report on our performance measures to FDOT and the federal government. With this being incorporated by resolution, we do not need to have that as an amendment separately to be approved by the MPO. So every time we do come in for a TIP, Approval is actually mentioned in that TIP document and it's incorporated by reference. The other action items that the board actually went over or heard and approved was the list of priority projects for 2020. And this list is actually being developed for our next round of our TIP, which will be fiscal year 22 through 26. The board also approved the current transportation improvement program, fiscal year 21 to 25. Uh, presentation was given on both the list of priority projects and also the TIP. Uh, the TIP included projects highlighting roadway uh, construction projects, resurfacing, lighting, pedestrian projects. The list of priority projects now also includes several uh, non-motorized pro projects like the Coder River underpass as part of the major list of priority projects. And that's all for the action items with regards to the June 11th meeting. And I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Ronnie. Any comments or questions by the board or anyone that's called in this afternoon? Okay, hearing none, we're going to jump to our action items. We have one item to discuss today, and that's the congestion management process, CMP. I believe is Wally going to make a presentation? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll I'll do that presentation. I don't know if uh, if anyone on staff has any opening comments or if I should just go ahead and, and jump right in. Okay. So uh, for the record, Wally Blaine, Tyndale Oliver. Uh, glad to be able to to present this virtually in front of you. And while 
Uh, I get to be the one that speaks about it. Uh, just know that there was a, a team effort uh, involved on this and a lot of great people uh, put some good work in. So I'll try and do my best to represent well uh, what's been done here. Um, and so the, the congestion management process um, consists really of two documents. One is uh, the state of the system report. The other is the policy and procedures handbook. Um, and where the policy procedures handbook kind of outlines um, the steps that will be taken, defines the goals and objectives, uh, the state in, of the system report really gets into the, uh, the data analysis of current conditions uh, and reporting of that. Uh, so just a couple of highlights about what was um, revised in some of these uh, with the passage of the FAST Act, the new um, federal legislation that came into place since the last update, uh, we made sure we were consistent with those um, those rules as well as the performance measures uh, and the recently adopted LRTP. There was also some changes uh, at the statewide level for reporting on the statewide the strategic highway safety plan uh, and the way that some of the data was uh, tagged or summarized, and I'll, I'll look at that. Uh, and then we also got the most recently available 2019 data for doing the analysis. And so on the next slide kind of gives you um, just an overview of, of what are uh, the eight steps really that Federal Highway kind of has, has provided in the most recent guidance about the congestion management process. Uh, and these eight steps, what we've done is kind of illustrated how they line up with these two documents of reports. So while the policy and procedures handbook covers an overview of all eight, eight actions or steps, um, it solely focuses on the, um, the, the objectives, defining the objectives for the congestion management process, defining the network as the major uh, arterial and collector roadways, uh, and identifying the performance measures that need and will be evaluated as part of the state of the system report. So the state of the system report goes through that process of, of collecting and analyzing the data, defining where congestion is and what are the causal factors as best we can for the congestion um, with the goal of identifying strategies that can be programmed through uh, the MPO's prioritization process for the TIP development. Um, and then that final step is once a, a strategy or a project has been implemented, um, how can we go back and evaluate the effectiveness of that project and make sure against the performance measures that we're doing what we hope to do uh, as, as part of that last step. So then uh, on the next slide, then I'll get into a little bit of some of the differences in the changes so specifically on the policy and procedures handbook. Um, it The procedures handbook says it will be updated every five years consistent with the long range transportation plan. So we have gone through that. And you can see uh, a detailed list of bullets here about what's included, but specifically highlighted what was updated uh, for this effort was making sure that we're consistent with uh, the federal requirements, um, that we've identified the, the appropriate network based on the capital improvement program and what the projects are that are, are programmed on the ground today. Uh, and then looking at those performance measures and making sure that they're updated to include uh, what was in the 2045 long range transportation plan uh, for consistency. Um, so one of the things real quick, I also wanna say, I know um, staff sent these out, uh, both these documents, you've, and there's been a chance to review them. Uh, we've gotten some comments already, but there's certainly, um, if you've got thoughts on these um, updates as well, we can, can, can address those um, uh, at, at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so on the next slide, we get into the actual performance measures um, and listed by, hopefully it's big enough on the screens that you guys have, you can, you can see this, um, um, by like a category or program. Uh, and then in green are the existing performance measures that, are, that have been in the congestion management process previously. Uh, and then highlighted in blue are the ones that have been added and most of these were added for either consistency with those performance measures uh, or consistency with the long range transportation plan. And you've also got that category on the end that was added um, because of the, the work that TBARTA does with the regional van pool program, recognizing that as a strategy that helps with uh, our, our peak hour congestion or alternatives for traveling. We want to have that in there as a strategy as well. Um, the specific note here is that the, the emphasis areas for the strategic highway safety plan were expanded um, and what was eight before is now gone to 13 um, all, and there's 13 measures now. Only 12 of those really are quantitative. One is about the data process that DOT uses for um, the safety data, but, but there was an expansion of 
the safety reporting data from, from eight measures to 13 measures. And, I, and there's a slide later that we'll talk about uh, some of that as well. So on the next slide, then, um, we jump into just an overview of the state of the system report. Um, it's updated a little more frequently um, with, with data that becomes available on every two or three years uh, so that it's updated with the LRTP. And then there's also one time during the five-year uh, cycle of the LRTP where the state of the system report is also updated. Um, didn't specifically call out um, any area to be updated on this because all of the data and the analysis was updated. Um, and so um, all, of, all of these categories where we updated the trends, looked at how the data has transitioned, uh, those congested corridors where the data are. One of the things that we noted and we'll talk about later is many of the performance measures that are set up are set up as percentage-based measures, you know, the percentage of roadway miles that are congested. Um, we think that perhaps moving forward, it may be a good idea to look at um, more qualitative numbers or total numbers rather than percentage-based numbers because um, we'll talk about how that um, is influenced when system changes happen. Uh, you could sometimes get a false positive or even a false negative uh, in the, the way that the, the measure moves because of the system conditions when you look at a, per, a percentage-based measure. Uh, so the next slide is just an, a graphic to illustrate uh, what's on page six of the state of the system report, hopefully a way to better categorize uh, and illustrate uh, the, the, the information rather than just a table, but to show um, <clears throat> where current conditions are across all the different categories of, of, of evaluating. Um, and so this was just a, a new graphic that was added uh, to illustrate what ultimately on the next slide is the tabular data um, of the state of the system report. Uh, and so this, this table is captured on page seven. Uh, and so a couple of the things uh, that you would wanna see on this is, uh, for instance, the miles of roadways uh, at level of service F uh, between 2014 when the report was last done and 2019, uh, have gone down. Um, and then while the interesting uh, and, and not different than what anybody's experiencing nationwide, um, the frequency of transit service actually went up. So uh, PCPT is providing more and frequent and um, service throughout the area, but ridership actually decreased. And that, that ridership decreased is not an anomaly uh, when you look at other transit systems uh, throughout the specifically Florida, but also even the nation. Uh, and then the safety measures are, you know, a kind of mixed bag uh, of going up and down. Um, <clears throat> specifically what you had though, um, is in the work zone related crashes, uh, that last row of the table, a, a definite decrease in the number of crashes that are reported in these two years. Uh, but then like uh, distracted driving, for example, uh, went up uh, the second to the last row on that table. So, so definitely a mixed bag uh, as far as uh, safety performance. Uh, one of the, the items on here about the bicycle and pedestrian performance, uh, the, the network information that we had um, was one of the areas where we, we received information um, specifically from Debbie as well as from, from Tina uh, about the, the system and what we should be categorizing it. So we are making some updates uh, for reporting on um, the presence of um, trail facilities as well as bike lanes and sidewalks to make sure we've captured um, better the information about what's happened over the last five years. And I know over several years and updates discussion about managing um, the, the, the information for sidewalks and bicycle facilities has been a discussion. Uh, so perhaps this is an opportunity then to be able to gather uh, more updated information and, and move that forward. Uh, on a better trajectory moving forward. So the next slide then um, looks at once we've conducted all of this analysis uh, and looked at the, the system conditions, how do we move in towards identifying where we have congested corridors and screening those um, for uh, existing projects? So you see those three circles on the bottom um, the policy and procedures handbook outlines this step of looking at what's currently programmed in the next five years, uh, what's part of the, the long range transportation plan, and then there are, are there areas 
that are congested where there's not a project or any type of study currently identified for resolving that. And so this three-step screening process really helps us go through um, looking at all of the areas of congestion, but recognizing that there are perhaps some projects already in the pipeline uh, for addressing those. And so then we look in, um, once we've gone through that three, those three screens, uh, looking at potential strategies that could be um, beneficial for, for addressing those strategies and coming up with, with uh, a list of, of potential strategies that could be moved forward. So the next slide um, has the map that lists um, the areas of congestion. And so what you can see are a bunch of you know, kind of annotation boxes uh, throughout the area that in, in blue um, identify the areas that are meeting that screen one criteria. Is there something already in the pipeline? Is there something being worked on uh, that perhaps is going to address these things? Um, is there something then with those black boxes uh, that's included in the long range transportation plan uh, that could help address those congested areas? And then those three that you see in purple, which are um, called out specifically on the next slide, are the, the three areas where um, we need to look at from this, the CMP's perspective. So the first is Gun Highway uh, down on the bottom bottom lower portion of the map, uh, that connection from, from State Road 54 uh, down into Hillsborough County. And we know that um, that's kind of a constrained corridor uh, going into Hillsborough County in the Keystone Odessa area. Uh, moving over to the east part of the county, you've got uh, the portion of Lock Street that then connects with uh, US 98 and then the, the bypass around uh, Dade City as kind of a one continuous corridor of congestion, uh, and then a portion of County Line Road North uh, also meets the, falls into the screen three um, as, as being an area that needs to be uh, kind of looked at or studied. And so the next slide lists um, what's in the state of the system report on pages 33 through 35. Um, and so those tables on the next slide look at um, what are um, the potential strategies that could could work for these areas. And one of the things that we found is, um, especially for, for Gun Highway and the, the Lock Street US 98 bypass around Dade City, um, is there's not much to be done. Um, we can look at some alternative work hours or perhaps telecommuting. One of the comments we got in some of the discussion we had with the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, was the fact that uh, I guess there's a vacant parcel there and DOT has looked at uh, US 301 north of that area, uh, perhaps some some uh, different um, uh, work that could be done there. Um, and, and there's also, I guess, some discussion about um, an intersection project with um, Lock Street and US 98 that was also mentioned as well. Looking at County Line Road, and a lot of this is um, because of the land use that's there and the way the, the, the travel happens in the corridor. Um, working through the, the, the screening criteria, uh, you get to adding general purpose lanes kind of as your last uh, resort effort. And really, we think that's the one that um, should be advanced uh, for County Line Road North. And there's been decades worth of discussions uh, about that corridor, uh, some analysis that even went into that as part of the long range transportation plan. Um, and so the next step really for that is to kind of coordinate and work with um, Hernando County on that, which it is it has been happening as well, but to continue that moving forward. And so then the final slide here um, just talks about some additional recommendations. And this is what I mentioned earlier. And, and clearly uh, these graphics aren't very clear. Um, but what you have on the graphic on the top shows the last time the state of the system report was done, we're looking at existing plus committed con conditions. So the, the conditions out to uh, what were at, it projected to be 2020 at the time are on the top. And what we have now is our, our projected conditions for 2024. Um, what you see is on the bottom graphic, there's, there's black circles and there's blue circles. And so the black circles identify those places where the level of service it is, is worse, the conditions are worse between the 2020 analysis and the 2024 analysis. And there's eight total. And on the blue is where the level of service conditions are projected to be better from these two sets of data. So in, in theory, you have now five new areas or five expanded areas where congestion is expected <clears throat> to have gotten worse. 
but because we've used a percentage based measure um, the percentage of roadway miles operating at level service f have increased and gotten better um, and so part of that is the two networks that are here the 2024 network includes um, the widening and extension of state road 56 that wasn't part of uh, the analysis and as a, as a newly opened roadway the traffic conditions are going to be great on that you'll have the construction of state road 52 bypass will be completed uh, the ridge road extension is expected to complete it so in this analysis that you've got a lot of additional roadway miles that are being added to the data set um, mm -hmm. and so when you look at it on a percentage basis um, it kind of skews the results a little bit um, and so that's just uh, to continue to to look at that uh, and consider that in future updates about it maybe a, a, a performance measure that needs to be changed uh, yeah. so that it better reflects um, the, what you're intending to uh, provide as the results to everyone um, so that kind of is a, is a brief update or quick update of the uh, both the congestion management process policy procedures handbook as well as state of the system report um, and so mr chairman if there's any questions i can can do my best to answer those uh and for you thank you wally for excellent presentation uh, it sounds like uh, staff has had the opportunity to review the, the information so We'll open it up to anyone that's here today or, or online for any additional comments. Um, Kurt, I see a question. Hey, Wally, um, the numbers for PCBT for uh, 2014, were those pulled off the NTD? So, yeah, the, the 2014, I think you're referring back to um, the table that is part of page seven uh, of the state of the system report that looks at um, service characteristics passenger trips those types of things yes you made a statement that uh, the numbers had gone down um, just to kind of give you some background we have had difficulty trying to confirm any number beyond 2016 so that was i know it was reported but just to give you a heads up it's uh we tried to recreate some of those numbers and had difficulty trying to find the data sources i, I can confirm uh, where we got those numbers from, um, I think ultimately, yeah, it probably does source back to the NTD, like you're saying. Um, I know we worked with um, the folks in our office that worked on the, the transit development plan. Okay, if you got it from there, it's NTD stuff. Okay, yeah. Just wanted to give you the background because you probably will get a question on that when you brief that Thursday. I, I appreciate that. Kurt, do you have anything different um, that, that would make more sense to use here, or is, is knowing that it's NTD data okay? Unfortunately, all I can go with the NTD. We've tried to find files, uh, data, um, I mean, everything in the world, looking through some old uh, emails or anything, and you couldn't find any spreadsheets or anything. So the best I can go with is the NTD data. Debbie? So, while I, I had a um, question for you about County Line Road North. When um, you were looking at the LRTP and doing the analysis that you did up there, did you take into account the improvements that DOT is doing up there at Shady Hills and Mariner at the intersection? I think there's actually two projects going on right now. So, um, I would think that would have some positive impact on the network. So did you look at that at all? Yeah, so I think um, the, the, the segment of um, County Line Road from east to Mariner um, is also showing up as being congested, but we know that there's a project in the LRT proof for that. Um, and then there's the intersection projects that are going on. One of the um, challenges we've run into with doing uh, the future um, the start to real level of service numbers um, is is we don't always get the benefit, especially from the travel demand model of of what those intersection improvements are going to be more from an operational standpoint uh, than they are travel on a corridor or arterial basis. Um, so it it it, it is certain, certainly something that if we've not noted that we can add into the discussion about that area, 
um, mm-hmm. as far as continued monitoring, monitoring of the conditions to see if they change, um, that once those projects are in place, kind of looking back and seeing how they, how the actually intersection operates and travel is through the corridor uh, versus just a straight travel demand and capacity based analysis. Okay, that'd be good. I know that they're um, doing right away acquisition right now at that intersection. Okay. And I think construct when is construction scheduled for that Shady Hill? Okay. Okay, and then I just had another comment. Um, I know that you based a lot of this on the 2019 and 2020 capital plan, but just so that you're aware, um, this year and over the next five years, I'm seeing some significant changes in revenue and I'm having to impact capacity projects. So potentially some of the ones that you were relying on to make an improvement to the level of service will not happen. So I see that you can do an update. You're gonna do an update in possibly 21, 22. And I think that's gonna be really important because I think it's gonna change the network significantly. Yeah, I, I think this, that's the difficulty of where we are today. Um, even thinking about the analysis that was done five years ago and expectations for travel in this year, um, certainly our travel patterns are changing, um, but mm-hmm. also our revenues that are being collected, the ability to do uh, projects on this on the network uh, are, are changing, and we'll see those effects. Uh, you know, there'll be a rolling effect of that over the next several years. Um, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, and it's starting. It is starting next year. Mm-hmm. In 21. Okay. Just let you know. Hey, Wally, on the transportation system trends, were, were we surprised at all with uh, two, two items that really stood out with the differences in total crashes and, and I guess the distracted driving crashes or that kind of the industry standard, unfortunately, today? I'm, I'm sorry, Todd. Was, I, I, I understand what you're talking about, but I wasn't sure. Did you want me to? Is there, how do you want me to respond on that? So maybe Venkat, can you please chime in on this? Do you want to provide something? So, can, can, can you repeat the question exactly? What, what, what uh, I was, Venkat, this is Todd. I, I'm looking yeah. at the tra- transportation system trends uh, sheet here with the Excel printouts between 2014 and 19 and the differences. And, of course, the two that really stand out are the total crashes and the, um, the I would say, the distracted driver uh-huh. crashes. And I, I didn't know if that was something we were a little bit surprised by. I'm not sure what we can do about that, but they really jumped out on this these trends. Okay, so what I'm looking at is actually I'm glad uh, you all called about that one because with, the, I don't know, I just copied the slide for my purpose because I'm working on a different grant or I want to see if this real data is also, we want to validate the data by using the in-house uh, cash data which we have. Because uh, uh, it, it, it makes, the. I agree with the trend, that makes sense because of if you look at the overall, uh, how much the people are using the, um, the technology for bad rather than using for good, the distracted driving crashes, yes, definitely going up. We observe that. And uh, Egusu, which we, is tough to document, but the any of the second crashes, yes, we, it went up because we observed that internally. And uh, crashes okay. went up. I agree. Okay. It's okay. Thank you for tech. Hey, Wally, Tina yes. Russo, MPO staff. Did the method of recording the data for crashes change? Not to my knowledge. The method of collecting the data didn't change. Uh, it was only in the way it was being summarized and reported. Um, so, for example, one of those was about um, DOT or, or, or um, highway safety motor vehicles that even looked at uh, heavy vehicles before, and now they're calling it commercial vehicles. Um, so there's a little bit of reporting differences. And then the the number of 
measures changed, uh, and I and I wasn't clear. The table that we've summarized and is shown on the screen, the 2014 data has been recalculated using those same measures um, instead of the eight measures that were previously listed. Thank you, Wally. Any other comments? Yeah, I actually have a, a few um, to piggyback off of what um, Debbie was talking about is um, I know that it's a 2020 update and it's 2019 state of the system, but I still think that for for next year, some sort of um, COVID effect needs to be taken into consideration. Um, like, for example, having carpools and van pools as the recognizing that as a strategy and the park and rides for as a TDM, I would be concerned, you know, with that simply because no one's going to do it in a COVID environment. I also noticed um, that, like, for example, as a congestion mitigation strategy so for, um, like, on highway, for example, one of the potential strategies is alternative work hours and telecommuting, and I think those are great suggestions, but I'm just not sure how you actually implement that. So I was just wondering what, what the ideas were to um, how does an MPO and a TBARTA actually implement that kind of a strategy. Um, and then I was also curious, um, you know, county staffs worked really hard over the years to um, have development conditions through Starkey Ranch, Bexley Ranch to add additional lane miles such as Tower Road, which they all have different names now, Bexley Ranch Boulevard and Hart uh, Rangeland Preserve. Um, but basically, there's been a lot of um, a lot of lane miles added. Sun Lake Boulevard is already constructed all the way north through Tower, and Tower Road is already being is under construction to Sun Lake from um, from the west over by the Sun Coast. Um, I call it Ashley Glen Boulevard, but it's Bexley Ranch Boulevard now, I think. So I was just curious um, because that could have a significant impact on some of the decreases in the LOSF uh, numbers that you've been seeing. And I was just wondering if that's something that you guys will be looking at and having that as a uh, as a uh, factor to uh, further annualize, analyze if those are the reasons why there's a decrease in uh, percentages for the LOSF areas. Um, and I think that's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, so just to yeah. respond quickly on those and, and uh, so, some really good points. Um, it, one of the things that I've seen recently is that the Miami-Dade TPO um, has, has um, I guess, commissioned a study or, or asked a consultant to look at um, what could be the long-term effects, not from carpooling and van pooling so much, but from the work from home environment? How is that going to affect uh, on the roadway? So hopefully, uh, uh, time goes on. There's there's a, a bigger body of of research work that's out there that can can uh, um, help glean some results from it on on that end. But I think you're right. What we're seeing is uh, the effect of uh, the, the current pandemic is a hesitancy or, or lack of desire to be in um, a mixed or a shared ride uh, opportunity. So that's if carpooling or even in public transportation, especially for the choice riders. Um, and, and so there there is going to be an impact on that. When we think about the gun highway and the alternative work hours or uh, telecommuting options, those are system-wide strategies. Uh, certainly they're not going to yield great results in any one area, uh, but they are opportunities that we should look for and ways that we should help, um, I, I guess, educate the commuters or people that are on the roadway network. What are the opportunities and options they have for not traveling? Um, and then the final point was on the roadway miles. And, and, and exactly what you're saying is why we want, we think that the, the, the process should include measures that look at actual numbers of roadway miles more than just percentages, because as the network expands and as you have more options for traveling uh, there there's going to be um, a, an adjustment or a balancing of trips if you will uh, throughout the network that will help hotspot congestion locations thank you wally any other comments anyone any comments from folks calling in well, here none. This is an action item. I think we need a call for a motion for this item to go to the MPO. Move to approve, Kurt Scheibel. I'll uh, second that, Debbie. Thank you. All in favor, signify by stating aye. 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 One against. Passes unanimously. Thank you. 
status reports, presentations, and updates. Hearing none, we'll move on to congestion management process task force issues. Hearing none, PCPT updates. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Hi, all. Kurt Scheibel, PCPT director. Well, it's been four years. Shady Hills is now ready to go. Uh, this was a briefing on the Shady Hills service. Uh, we have the buses. We have the stuff. We know the stops. We're ready to rock and roll. As you can see up there, hourly service. We're going to go Monday through Saturday. We're looking from 5.30, 8.30, 6.30, 7.30 for Saturdays. Uh, two buses running our headway each way. We will be connecting with our 1620 and in the purple, uh, I'm sorry, the blue route up in Hernando. Uh, the good news is, is we're able to get Hudson High School twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. So we'll hit there probably about uh, 45 minutes to an hour before school starts, and we'll pick them up about 45 minutes after school ends. And then we have the option, depending on what's going on, to uh, hit more times there in the afternoon school, and I'll get with that when we get to the, some of the routes. Kind of hard to see from us here, but you probably see it up the, on your screens there. What we're going to do is we're going to start by 5A. We'll circle 5A school. We'll head down 5A to uh, on 52, head at 52 on Hayes. We'll go to Hayes until the dead ends, hit Kitten Trail, and kind of go up Little and across over to um, Denton Avenue, hit Denton Avenue all the way down Denton Avenue to Peace, Peace to Shady Hills, up Shady Hills, circle around the Publix there on County Line Road. And that's where we'll connect with the uh, blue route and then next slide please turn around and do it coming back home so it works really well it's about a 47 minute gives us a couple minutes on each side to uh, make up time due to traffic wheelchairs boarding issues whatever next slide the good news is we're hitting a lot of good little uh, places. The Vincent House, as you don't know, is being built and it should be opening up here any time now if it's not already open, uh, right next to the Fasano Shelter. We're also hitting the Fasano Shelter and the, uh, the uh, Department of Health. We expect a lot of traffic there. We're looking at eventually uh, working on a bus cutout parking and then a bus stop with a crosswalk and we're working those issues as we speak. We're also going to hit a few elementary schools, a few high middle schools, and of course both 5A and Hudson High. Slide please. Medical services, we also hit the uh, big um, medical center. It's up there right there behind that Publix. I don't know if you knew up there, there's a lot of medical offices and there's a hospital, um, uh, the Florida Center uh, Thank you. I can remember the name. My mind went blank. So we'll be hitting that too. And that's going to be a really big service for our community. So we'll be hitting those areas and you can see the different spots for different places that we're hitting both north and south. Slide please. Education services, of course, all the various fun funds. We're really excited though that the Vincent House is where they're at because I know we'll be servicing a lot of people will be riding that our bus to the Vincent House and being using our services to get to and from that, that location. Lots of different places up and down there. The one thing I did notice is that um, we've been having a lot of requests about two, three years ago from um, one of the churches on Shady Hills. They had started a program to help bring people out of homelessness and getting them job skills and so forth to move forward. And they were looking to uh, when we're going to bring bus service up there because they're going to the people that are homeless and usually don't have transportation getting buses so um we'll be driving up and down there i've been trying to find the person's name and i called the phone number she had but it's out of service now <clears throat> pardon me so but um i don't know if that service is still there we're still trying to find the lady and we have the we think we know which church is but we've reached out to the church and left a message but that's something that we're looking for in uh, the different churches on shady hills i know they were all banding together to do that type of thing so we're really kind of still trying to reach out but hopefully when they start seeing the buses and the bus signs go up they'll reach back out to us again and we can move forward and of course there's a whole bunch of other services we're going by parks we're going by uh, hud houses we're going by a lot of people in that area and when you do the actual uh, numbers this is the only area that is in a, an environmental justice area that we have not hit in pasco county and it's along the 
uh, Denton and Shade, uh, Denton and uh, Peace Road. That's the only environmental justice area we haven't hit. Now we've actually hit all the environmental justice areas that would qualify. So now we're uh, meeting all our requirements now and uh, we're moving forward. So a lot of different areas we're going to and I'm very uh, pleased that we're able to do this finally. Slide again. This is the cutout. We'll be head, what we're basically going to be doing is we're we'll returning uh, left on Hudson and heading up to Cobra Way. If you ever been up to Hudson High School, we're able to get around their little um, speed bumps and head behind the, the football field. We're going to have a stop over there at the corner there for the elementary junior high and around the corner by the high school. Although we don't expect a lot of high school or um, junior high folks. What we can do, though, is I've been working with Tad and um, uh, I won't say her name's Becky. I'm going to have that for the uh, other one, but she's a Title I coordinator for the school district. They're going to provide passes for people, parents, to be able to go to PTA meetings and events, school plays, football games, basketball games, volleyball games, things like that. And we're going to see if we can do bus service during those time periods so people can go see their parents, can go see their kids. And that is the thing that we're right now, we're in the very, very beginning of stages of that. But that is where my goal is, is eventually allow parents to be able to see their kids play football, JV games, eighth graders, seventh graders. Because when a parent's involved in a kid's education and a kid sees a parent there, their chances of graduating high school are huge. It increases significantly. And I don't remember the number from my college days, but it is a big, big uh, bonus. And so we'll be able to provide that service down the road. So, um, and we'll be coordinating both the principal. The one thing I don't know if you do notice that at Northwestern Elementary and the uh, Hudson Junior High, I believe they're both shut down this year because of being refurbished. It's only the high school's working right now, but uh, we will be providing service during that time period. And then of course, southbound there. Here's the schedule just for reference in case anybody wants to take a look at it. The red is where we'll be cutting back and forth between the high school and then southbound. And then me, if you have any questions about the Shady Hills, I can go over there and then I can also talk about the, uh, just give my update real quick. Good news is, is our uh, COA, our uh, grants have been all uh, approved. The, um, it's going to the board here, it should be out in the next, the first week of September. Um, if everything goes well, the COA will be on the exact same board meeting. Um, agenda item, but if I have to go through the legal team, that's still kind of in question right now, it may be delayed. Um, my gut feeling is, is we're going to either get it at the first one or the second one in, uh, in September. I don't think the legal team needs to review the COA uh, scope. If that's the case, then you can expect the COA to be starting by the time we get ready to meet next time, because I'll know by then. Um, so in October, September timeframe, or October, November, going the wrong way, uh, we're going to be trying to be setting up meeting with this body uh, Tend all of them will be to get your opinions on what's going on. Uh, the big thing is we're also seeing the same things that um, you were referring to about the uh, TIF funding that it's going to be, uh, which is surprising that uh, it's going to be some TIF allocation issues going forward. And my budget, I'm going to have to really look at what we're providing and how we're providing it. And a COA is going to be important, big part of that. One of the things is, is that I would like to start serving, I'll make sure we are hitting all the high schools and some of the elementary junior high schools if, if possible. Um, but that's not the sole source of my COA. Are we hitting, as far as I've been able to determine, a COA has never been done in Pasco County ever. So I'm trying to get everybody in their brother, their sister, whoever has a stake in it that I could possibly reach out to, I'm trying to reach out to it, including the writers. I'm gonna have people on the bus for a week, every bus, every day for a week, taking surveys of the riders to make sure that they know what they want because they're the ones doing it. And then I'm also gonna hit the economic councils. We're gonna to talk to the MPO. We're gonna to talk to the uh, um, long range developers, all the different folks. We're gonna to talk to the, both Zephyr Hills Council, State City Council, um, Newport Ritchie, Port Ritchie, get all the people that we could possibly get, get what they need. And then also talk about where are our medical uh, centers and things like that and what are their needs. And then start trying to develop, are we serving the area with the resources we have and how can I grow the system? And if I have to shrink the system, how do I shrink the system the right way? And make sure that the manpower is there, the staffing's there 
and the back office staff is there to support this both in the county resources and the staffing resources. So we're all doing that. The other thing is, is that we're also moving forward with a uh, growing our building. So we've got funding in there for our new building. Uh, the good news is, is that if everything goes with the uh, pro appropriations, and I don't know how much grant funding everyone gets through the 50 uh, Highway Transportation Act grants, but if you didn't know, the THUD is called the THUD Act this time. I don't know what it's called, but it's 100% share. FTA share is 100%. There's no 50 50 or 80 20. So we're seeing if we can work to get a full building out of that. And that includes the 5339 bids, uh, competitive bids for buses. So just making sure you're aware of that. And that's how we're hopefully going to get a new building, get the federal government to pay for it. So uh, that hasn't been passed yet. That's still in <coughs> committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, or actually the Senate, is, uh, the uh, House has passed it, the Senate is under advisement. So, and of course, everybody's out until after the elections. So this will be the 21 uh, budget. So I, we're going to go again with the continuing resolutions. This is everyone who's been in transit knows and highway bill people know that happens. Um, we are buying some new, uh, we're waiting some letters back from FDOT to buy some new vehicles also because we need a total revenue credit. And so we're working on that too. Other than that, not much more. Any questions for me? Thank you, Kurt. Thanks. It's exciting to hear. I like to hear that, about that homeless uh, project service and what you're doing with the churches there. And really excited. I, I love that idea about getting parents to the athletic events. That, that's super cool. <laughs> So thank you for that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we're down to any other business by any of the, the board members, um, upcoming meetings. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yes, this is Ronnie Black here again. Okay. Just wanted to let everyone know, and I'm not sure if we mentioned it to you at a previous meeting or to the TAC at a previous meeting, but beginning next calendar year, the MPO, with regards to the board meetings, the TAC and CAC will be going to bite on the meetings. Uh, the CAC and TAC will. I had a little Hello? difficulty understanding him, Manny. Did you understand what he said? Yeah, because I know what he's talking about. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's you, better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to let you know, for the uh, calendar year 2021, the MPL, TAC, and CAC meetings will be bi-monthly. Uh, okay. It to, we, at our June MPL meeting, we mentioned it to the board indicating that we were looking at going with bi-monthly meetings. This is due to some meetings being lightly, having uh, light agendas on them for having meetings every month. And just some of the schedules that have been presented to us from our board members, uh, what have you. And so we're looking at going with a bi-monthly meeting. CAC and TAC will be meeting in January, March, May. Mm -hmm. July, October, and November. Uh, the October meeting actually meetings will be was being rescheduled from September to October. So you will have October and November meeting actually sort of be a back month back to back month meeting. The reason for that is that the development of the TIP and the work program necessitated us uh, moving that meeting between September meeting to an October meeting. So we still will be on schedule. We'll just be, you know, planning things uh, far in advance. And then the NPO board will be meeting on the opposite, the alternate house. So the NPO board will be meeting in uh, March, I'm sorry, February, April, June, June, August, October. And this information will be given to you when the NPO board, you know, looks at it and votes at it. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say, Ronnie, we'll, we'll provide this okay. to you all in writing. Okay. Yeah. At the end of the year, we'll do the uh, 
calendar year for next year, you'll see it all in black. So exactly. This is just to let you know this is the what is being proposed. Once it's finalized, we'll definitely have that out to you well in advance of the beginning of the meetings next year. So will we have monthly meetings from now until December? Uh, yes, ma'am. Those are, have already been programmed. So we'll continue okay. with the schedule for this year. Okay, and then January we kick in the new schedule. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But if there is a need for an additional meeting, we will meet. We just okay, that's good. Minimum okay. six. Well, okay. Okay. Well, that's, okay. And that's a that's a part of our bylaws and the public participation plan. Also, that that doesn't change. Thank you, Ronnie. I have a question. Um, Jensen, are you you still on board here? Are you able to chime in? Go ahead, Jensen. I'm here, Todd. Hey, Jensen. Um, I just had a question. The city's been working, uh, well, a couple things with De Deborah Bulldog here. She's been very helpful in working with Billy and myself on the County Road 54 project, and which we're going to hopefully get council to buy off on tonight. And one of the things we've talked about to help us out is to investigate SIGP. Uh, grant opportunities for for an alternate road project and I just wanted to check with you is, is that something you could investigate to see uh, balances and cycles and uh, for the city to have an opportunity to look into that yeah I can get back to you on uh, numbers if that's what you're looking for um, of correct what we kind of can foresee um but you just have to give me the specifics on what it is that you would be kind of asking for I can go to that. yeah what, what we're investigating is we got about uh some of this year ready where but simon's road the city took over from the county and we improved probably 90 percent of it but with uh <clears throat> about a thousand units uh various stages of entitlements and construction on simon's road uh, with the improvement, we're seeing that already as a reliever uh, of 301 to the west uh, for folks coming down Fort King Road and no longer have to uh, go over to the west to get the 301 to go south. Now they can cut through Simons Road to get the Island Boulevard to bypass around Zephyr Hills 54. So there, there's two projects, uh, one's under design engineering this year. And we hope to finish the connection of Simon's Road to Fort King on the north end. And so we were hopefully uh, looking into the opportunity for that as a, a potential project. And, and then at the same time, we're, we're going to have uh, obviously additional uh, congestion and, and issues is a Southern uh, connection from Simons to Island Boulevard, which we're gonna have to design engineer. And we've had some preliminary discussions. Um, so really it's the two bookends of that project as uh, you know, a reliever for 301, um, cities built 90% of the road and we're just trying to see if there's any opportunity for SIGP for, for those two projects. Well, first things, I'm glad that you're getting Simon's Road uh, completed out there. I know I was there with you. Yeah, it was pretty messy, yeah. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I will uh, look into this for you um, and uh, see what I can find out, uh, especially for those two intersection kind of improvements that you're um, speaking of there at Simon's at Fort King and then Simon's at uh, Island Boulevard. Thank you, Jensen. Appreciate yep. it. Um, I just had a couple other notes here just for general information, uh, we've completed probably two thirds of Cossack Road. Um, that that's a, gonna be a future nice connection from Old Lakeland Highway down Otis Allen. Uh, it's a developer driven project, uh, Zephyr Lakes, it's called Abbott Park now actually. But two thirds of it's been built and the final third is required by the development order to be continued to the east to connect to Wire Road and Otis Allen by December, 2021. So the segment that's been built is four lane, uh, nice median trees, sidewalk, trail. So it's a it's a nice project and just want to keep the county aware of that. 
Um, you know, I, I don't believe we ever heard back and uh, I've been asked about the status of the resurfacing of Wire Road. I, I believe we had an email from someone, I don't recall who at this time, but just if we could find out the, the status of two resurfacing projects, I believe that were in this year or next year's uh, resurfacing uh, uh, calendar for Wire Road and Geiger Road. <clears throat> And then I think everyone realizes all the development that's happening around us on uh, State Road 56 and 301, a lot of residential projects. And we're hoping that perhaps, uh, you know, Morris Bridge, I, I don't know. I, I know these projects, developers pay mobility fees, but if there's an opportunity to put that right turn lane on uh, Morris Bridge southbound onto 56. Uh, so the answer to that is yeah. Good. The answer is yes. Um, we're actually going to be looking at that uh, turn lane as part of the improvements that we're doing at Morris Bridge and Chansey. So we've included that um, turn lane. Okay. Down to westbound turn lane from Morris Bridge to 56. Oh, I, I've seen some activity also at Morris Bridge and Chansey. What, yeah, what's the update on that? Surveying it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that'll be huge. So that's still programmed, but then we're, we were able to add in that turn lane on Morse Bridge. Mm, to the very good. Very good. Part of that work. Okay. It's not connected, but it's related. Okay. Thank you. That's all that I had. Anybody else have any comments? Anybody virtually have any comments? The, um, you have, I don't know what we've Yes, uh, TC member round table, table um, any future agenda topics? Anybody have anything? No. If uh, hearing none, uh, the next meeting date is September 7th, 2020. We're gonna be meeting in Dade City next meeting. I guess it'll be virtually as well. Um, okay, hearing, hearing nothing else, I'll uh, call for motion for adjournment. Uh, is that Labor Day? That's close. Hmm. Is that the third or fourth? The third. Yeah. The third's a Thursday. Oh. The seventh is a Monday. Yes, that's Labor Day. Good catch, Cynthia. I know my holidays, man. I don't get a lot of them. <laughs> you might need to revisit that date. Uh, let me look on the uh, calendar to make sure first. Uh, September 7th is, yeah, we have a holiday. On the calendar, Manny, it's on Tuesday the 8th. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thanks, Lydia. Thank you. I try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So motioned. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Todd.